Hey everybody, welcome to WTF Hammer Underworlds. So today's video is going to be the final Season 4 Warband review, this time looking at Elethane Soul Raid, who are going to be available for pre-order very soon. So I just want to give my initial thoughts. So we're going to start by taking a look at this Warband's fighter cards, their faction-specific cards, that being their objective and power cards. Then we'll be raiding this Warband. Theoretically, obviously I have not played them, nor has anybody else. But based on their cards and their mechanics alone, I'm hoping to gauge their tier as it relates to every other warband that has been released thus far. So we'll just jump right into it as usual, starting with this warband's fighter cards. There are five units in this warband, making them distinct from all the other Dire Chasm warbands, which always thus far have had either four or six units. And these guys have a Inspire mechanic and even Inspire side that uh, I don't really know what to think of. They basically all Inspire in the second round kind of implying that the tides come in and since these guys are basically sea elves, they can profit from that. And they do definitely get boost as you're going to see, but they also do lose their flood tide ability, which I'll describe. And uh, I don't really, I don't really know what to think about that, at least as far as the Ideneth are concerned. Anyway, we'll just start by looking at the leader, Elethane Ill-Fated, who is an Ideneth. He has that keyword, also has a hunter keyword, has a melee and ranged attack, melee being the talon sickle, range being the soul net. And all of his attacks have the Soul Harvest ability. Whereas a reaction after this attack action, if this takes an enemy fighter out of action, and there's no friendly Tamail on the battlefield, who is another unit in this warband, you could place that Tamail on a starting hex in your territory. So it basically allows you to steal the soul of enemies and put them into an ally, assuming he has died. So obviously encourages you to lead with Tamail. And then if he dies, it's not such a big deal because he can be brought back by Elethane. Uh, the attacks themselves are pretty decent. Three hammer, two damage, gaining cleave and ensnare when inspired. So obviously big increase in accuracy. Soul net being a little bit less exceptional. Two swords, one damage, going to three swords, but getting ensnare when inspired. And having that flood tide ability, which I'll describe soon, but losing it when becoming inspired. And the flood tide ability is good, so that's why I, there is a bit of a trade-off here. And uh, obviously becoming inspired in the second round, and then at the third round, no longer being inspired. So first round and third round, not inspired. Second round, everyone inspired. Uh, four move, going to five move, inspired. One shield, four wounds. So defense, not exceptional, but pretty decent leader stats. Next is Furan, who is also an Ideneth and a Hunter, who has a melee hell saber doing two damage off of three swords, becoming three hammers when inspired. So obviously a big increase in accuracy for these guys when they inspire. Uh, same inspire mechanic, four move going to five move, two dodge going to two shield when inspired, only has three wounds though. And this brings me to the flood tide ability, which all the Ideneth have when uninspired, in which when activated, this fighter can make a move action or charge action if it has one or fewer move tokens. So they can basically move twice or move and then charge. But like I said, can't do it if they're inspired. So a bit of a loss cut is definitely a good ability. Next, there's Tamail, the revivable unit, who's also an Ideneth and a Hunter, who has a two range and a three range attack. Two range landing on two hammers, doing two damage, getting ensnare when inspired. Range attack being three swords, one damage, also gaining ensnare when inspired and having the impact ability where it's an extra damage on a charge. So a nice range attack, especially since it can be reused over and over again. Has Flood Tide when uninspired and also has the Rip Tide ability. Where in the drive back step, you can push the target one hex instead of driving the target back, which works really nice with the thrown harpoon because you can just charge in, throw the harpoon, do decent damage with high accuracy, and then drag or just move the enemy one hex in any direction so desired. If he gets taken out of action, he can be brought back, have that charge token removed, and maybe even do it twice in the same round. So very nice unit. Four move, going to five move, going from one to two dodge when inspired, and also having only three wounds. Next, we have the Crab, who is meme central on the Facebook page. Dewan Claw has a crushing claw, two swords, two damage, going to three swords and getting cleave when inspired. So like I said, increase in accuracy across the board for these guys. That's their main boon when they inspire. Is a beast, so can't have attack action upgrades or hold objectives. Has the scuttle reaction, though, which is cool. After another friendly fighter's activation, you can push this fighter one hex closer to that fighter. So allows him to just kind of shimmy around the board. And his base stats don't change when inspired, having three move, two shield, three wounds either way. And finally, a very interesting unit, Spinefin, who isn't a fighter in the typical sense, has no move, one dodge, one wound, gets two dodge when inspired though. 
and it's really just exists to be an inconvenience, obviously not physically threatening, can be used to deliver some power cards, which we'll see a little bit later, but has two abilities, small fry, where you can decide not to set this fighter up during the setup. Uh, this fighter cannot make actions, be given upgrades or hold objectives. If it would be taken out of action, remove it from the battlefield and clear all counters and persisting effects from this fighter. It is not taken out of actions. Therefore, being taken out of action does not result in the enemy getting a glory point or scoring objective cards that require them to take enemies out of action. So that's nice. Kind of makes him expendable, sort of like the Skaven card. And the Shoal reaction is the more interesting mechanic. After an opponent's power step, pick one, remove all friendly shoal tokens from the battlefield and place a shoal token in an empty hex or place this fighter in an empty hex that contains a friendly shoal token and remove that token. You can take this reaction even if this fighter is, on, is not on the battlefield. So nice, because you can just inconvenience enemies. Put a shoal token on an unheld objective and then next power step, just slap them onto an objective that an enemy might want. You can even put a guard token on him if you want to, so they can't get him off without killing him. And then killing him gets them nothing, so he just becomes a burden. Could also be used for support purposes to reduce movement options so enemies are forced to move through lethal hexes. Definitely a cool and interesting unit. And uh, just to summarize, pros. These guys have special abilities. Ensnare when inspired, Cleave when inspired, uh, special combat abilities, sorry. Uh, their unique special abilities include Soul Harvest, which revives to male, Flood Tide, which gives them that whole second move. Riptide, which allows Tamail to push enemies. Impact, which is that extra damage for Tamail. Scuttle, which is the Dewan Claw push mechanic. And then the whole small fry shoal spine fin thing. They have reach and ranged attackers. They have an effortless inspiring mechanic. Sorry for the typo. So they really don't have to do anything. They just become inspired in second round. So it kind of alleviates having to overthink it. They have the hunter keyword, at least the Ideneth do. And they have a medium model number, five units that gives them some versatility. Although only three of these guys can hold objectives. Cons, they have an impermanent Inspire. There's not really anything you could do to inspire these guys in the first round. There is a way to keep them inspired in the third round, as we'll see later when we look at their power cards. But the Inspire mechanic really is independent of the actions of the player. And I say they have generally low defense, low wounds. You know, leader only has one shield, four wounds. Everybody else has three or one. Uh, a little bit squishy. Anyway, that does it for these guys' fighter cards. Let's look at their objective cards, starting with the Surge. There is Merciless Raiders for one glory. Score this immediately after a friendly fighter's attack action made as part of a charge action. That takes an enemy fighter in enemy territory out of action. So just charge, get a glory if you take them out in enemy territory. Given this an A, pretty reliable. You could miss the attack though, or you could be charging against a very durable unit. So not a guarantee. There's Smothered Memories, worth one. Scores immediately after an opponent discards a card from their hand in the action phase without playing it or scoring it. So I'm giving this an A, only because there are many power cards to help bolster this mechanic, as you'll see. But generally speaking, this would be pretty hard to score it would force, because it would only be scorable if an enemy decided to discard an objective card and draw an objective card, or if they had a power card that forced themselves to discard their own power cards kind of thing. So uh, it would typically be out of the player who's playing this card's control. But like I said, there are power cards to help bolster this. Next is Speed of the Flood Tide, worth one. Scores immediately after an activation if three or more friendly fighters are in enemy territory. Uh, I think it's good. Giving it an A could be worth an S. Spinefin can just end up there automatically. Dewan Claw can just scuttle there pretty much effortlessly. You have to kill enemies in enemy territories. So there's lots of reasons to enter enemy territory which make this pretty reliable. Surging Tide, scores immediately after one friendly fighter's second or subsequent move action in the same phase. So it works great with Flood Tide. So obviously nice if you draw this in the first round. If you have it in the second round, you're unlikely to score it. If you maintain your inspiration in the third round with that power card I talked about, also unlikely to score this. I'm giving it an A, could be worth a B. I don't really know. Next there's Taker of Souls. Worth one, scores immediately after your leader's range one attack action that takes an enemy fighter out of action. So, I mean, pretty reliable. Elethane's the most reliable attacker, I'd say, given this an A. Hopefully he's not taken out of action before this happens because his defense is pretty low. And that does it for the Surge. Next, the score in the end phase cards, we have Cold Eyed Killers worth two. Scores in an end phase if two or more enemy fighters were taken out of action in the preceding action phase. Uh, given this a B, obviously in a three to four player game, it's much easier to pull off. But in the typical two player game, this is not a guarantee. And these guys are not necessarily heavy hitters. Next, worth one is Guardians of the Deep. It scores an end phase if no enemy fighters are in your territory. Uh, given this a C, I mean, Denial is worth three in the third end phase. If this were worth two, it would be more worthwhile. And it's only really scorable 
if your enemy is just not that interested in advancing or if with these guys you put on such an aggressive assault that they don't have the opportunity to advance but these guys aren't the most durable and they're not the most damaging so i just feel that this is going to be very circumstantial in terms of whether or not it's able to get scored there's soul raiders worth one scores in an end phase if two or more enemy fighters are out of action uh given this a b Pretty likely to happen at some point in the game. Only worth one on an end phase. If drawn in the first round, it's likely to not be scored. Although it depends on the warband you're facing. Next, there's Tides of Death. Scores in an end phase if three or more friendly fighters each have one or more charge token worth one. Uh, so this is more like it. I'm giving this an A. You have three guys charged as long as they don't die before the end phase. You score this. Uh, I think it's pretty reliable. Really depends on how many units you have left. Uh, next is Unseen Menace, worth one. Scores in an end phase if two or more friendly Ideneth are within two hexes of the same enemy fighter. Uh, so pretty reliable. I mean, as long as you don't kill the enemy and he manages to survive to the end phase and you have two guys who are close to him, uh, I'm giving this an A. Might be worth a B. I guess it depends on the type of push cards you decide to put in your deck. Next is Utter Isolation, worth two. As a duel, scores in an end phase if there are one or more surviving friendly fighters and no fighter is adjacent to any other fighter. Uh, I'm giving this a C, sort of like alone in the darkness, and I do like it, but it does kind of work against other objective cards that these guys have, where they're encouraged to be close to enemies. They're also encouraged to advance into enemy territory. It's impossible to know if enemies are going to actively try to cluster their fighters as well. Lots of variables that make this uncertain. And uh, finally, we have the score in the third end phase card worth three. Scores in third end phase if each enemy fighter is either out of action or adjacent to one or more friendly fighters. So this obviously works against utter isolation. Uh, the annihilation aspect is obviously very hard to pull off. The clustering is a bit more reliable, but it depends on if you kill an enemy, then they're not adjacent to your guys anymore. I'm giving this a B, probably worth a C, not an exceptional card. I do like the glory point value though. And uh, that brings me to the end of this section objective cards typically promote having enemies discard their cards taking enemy fighters out of action entering enemy territory moving friendly fighters more than once defending friendly territory isolating fighters and swarming enemies next we're going to move on to the power cards starting with the gambits we have brain barnacles choose one enemy fighter within three hexes of one or more friendly ideneth the chosen fighter has minus one move to a minimum of zero. In addition, if the chosen fighter is within one hex of one or more friendly Ideneth when this card is played, that fighter's attack actions have the Fury characteristic. This effect persists until the end of the round or until that fighter is taken out of action. So a very solid card, good movement impairment, possibly very good accuracy impairment. I'm going to give this an A. Next is Chill Mist. In the next activation, fighters have minus one move to a minimum of zero and cannot make range three plus attack actions. Uh, also good. Minus one move is great. No guarantee you're fighting against ranged opponents though, so I'm giving it a B. Might be worth an A. Uh, if you are playing against ranged opponents though, this is very impactful. Third is Cloud of Midnight. Choose one friendly fighter. Until the end of the next activation, that fighter cannot be the target of attack actions, cannot be chosen or damaged by gambits, and cannot be pushed. So amazing defense card. Ensures that one friendly fighter is safe. Can't even be pushed into lethal hexes. Uh, I'm giving this an S. Great, great card. There's Crushing Pressure. Choose an enemy fighter. That fighter player picks one. In the next activation, the chosen fighter has minus two move to a minimum of zero and minus two dice from their attack actions to a minimum of one, or that player discards one power card. So I'm giving this an S as well. I mean, timed appropriately, especially against warbands that have few units that are very essential, this could really cripple the enemy. And the only way out of it is to discard a card, which allows you to score an objective card if you have that objective card in hand. Uh, I really like this card. Could be worth an A though, but I think it's very solid. Next, there's Forgotten Nightmares. When an enemy fighter makes an attack action, pick one eligible fighter as the target of that attack action, unless during the declare attack action step, that enemy fighter's player discards one power card. This effect persists until the end of the round. So nice, because you can dictate where the enemy is going to attack. So if you swarm and the enemy has more than one target, you can play this card and either forces them to move so that they do not have more than one target, which could be inconveniencing for them if they want to make multiple attacks in the round. Or they just let you decide, or they're forced to discard a card, which obviously sucks for them, and then possibly scores you that objective card. So I'm giving this an S as well. Also might be worth an A, but I like it just because it's a big brain card. There's Fury of the Storm. Play this only in the third round. Each surviving friendly fighter is inspired, unless another player discards two power cards, in which case nothing happens. So you can keep all your guys inspired. They're obviously better when they're inspired. They lose that whole double move ability. Uh, can be nullified by your opponent if he discards two power cards, which is pretty steep. 
and also, like I said, benefits you for for scoring that objective card. So given this uh, B, I don't know why I wrote B here. I'm actually going to give this an A. I think A is more appropriate. Next is Phantasmal Forms. In the next activation, friendly fighters have a defense characteristic of three dodge, which is excellent. Given this an A, even brings your one dodge or one shield units up to three, which is great. Shifting Currents, pick one. Remove all friendly shoal tokens from the battlefield and then place one shoal token in an empty hex or pick one objective token in an empty hex and move that objective token into an adjacent hex. You cannot move it into a lethal hex or a hex that contains a feature token. It allows you to be more speedy with how you manipulate spine fin, or you can just move an objective token, which is very, very nice. Although it cannot be occupied, which is unfortunate. I'm giving it an S though, because I think everybody's going to be putting this card in their deck just because of the shock factor of spine fin, if nothing else. Spine fin toxin restricted to spine fin. Choose one enemy fighter adjacent to a friendly spine fin. Deal one damage to that fighter. In addition, the chosen fighter cannot hold objectives, cannot be on guard, and cannot make range three plus attack actions. This effect persists until the end of the round or until that fighter is out of action. So great card. I gave it an A, might be worth an S. Really just screws one fighter over completely, depending on their play style, obviously. Uh, because there are some fighters who are just more aggressively oriented, I'm not giving this an S because it might not be so useful against them. But against other fighters, it can really screw the enemy's game plan. There's Terror Knight Venom, also a poison. These guys have quite a few poisons. Choose one enemy fighter adjacent to one or more friendly fighters. You can reroll one attack dice in attack rolls for attack actions made by friendly fighters that target the chosen fighter. This effect persists until the end of the round or until that fighter is out of action. So a good card. Gave it a B. Could be worth an A. Obviously works well if you're playing against a warband who has a very crucial fighter that you want to just ensure that you land several attacks against. Against Zarbag's Gits or something, though, it's not very useful. And that does it for the Gambits, which typically promote reducing enemy movement, reducing enemy accuracy, increasing friendly accuracy, improving defense, preventing enemy ranged attacks, dictating enemy attacks, prompting card discard, inspiring friendly fighters, moving objectives, and crippling an enemy. And finally, we have the upgrade cards, starting with Armor of the Kaife, restricted to Ideneth, minus one dice from adjacent enemy fighters, attack actions that target this fighter to a minimum of one. So a nice little defense boost, giving it an A. These guys need defense. Next is Born from Agony, restricted to Ideneth as well, gives plus one wounds and makes the fighter immune to lethal hexes. Uh, given this an S, great card, thematically cool too, since they're born and raised in a very harsh environment. I see this getting played in every deck. Next is Aether Sea Predator, restricted to Dune Claw. This fighter's crushing claw attack action has Ensnare, which is nice. And also as a reaction during an enemy fighter's move action, after that fighter enters a hex adjacent to this fighter, for the first time in that action, roll one attack dice on a roll of hammer that fighter's move action ends. So definitely cool, especially nice since Dune Claw can scuttle around and put himself in positions which might screw enemies that have to take the long route around him to get to enemies that they might want to get to i'm giving this a b could be worth an a my only concern is that it's restricted to and claw obviously it should be but he only has three wounds good defense though but if they just decide to charge him and kill him this ability may never come into effect and it is only a 33 percent chance that he grabs the enemy fighter as well which is not great next there is hunter of souls restricted to ideneth Plus one damage to this fighter's attack actions that target a fighter with one or more wound counters. So giving it a day. Not quite as good as Great Strength, but still good. Next, there's Lure Light, restricted to Elethane. When an enemy fighter is taken out of action while adjacent to this fighter, that fighter's player picks one. You gain a glory point or that player discards one power card. So I like it. I think it's good. I don't like that the opponent gets to decide what happens, though, which is my only real drawback of this thing. Next is Martial Excellence. Restricted to Furan, if this fighter has one or more charge tokens, this fighter is on guard. So great card. Unfortunately, that it's restricted to Furan. I'm going to give it a B because of that. Next, there's Sanguine Pearl. Restricted to Ideneth. Reduce the damage dealt to this fighter by adjacent enemy fighters. Attack actions by one to a minimum of one. So good card, giving it an A. Unfortunate that it doesn't work against ranged attacks, though. There's Soulbound. When this fighter makes an attack action, if there is a friendly Elethane within three hexes, that fighter is considered to be supporting this fighter. Restricted to Tamale. So nice if these guys move together. Tamale is always supported. Uh, given this a B, only because it's restricted to Tamale. Could be worth an A, though, because he is revivable. There's Unstoppable Fury. You can reroll one attack dice in this fighter's attack rolls for attack actions made as part of a charge action. So also good, just more reliable attacks related to charges giving it an a and finally voltane eel an attack action upgrade for elethane 
three range, three swords, one damage. On a crit, you give a move token. Uh, not great, giving it a B. Could be worth a C. This guy already has a range attack action that's not much worse than this. Getting a crit is not a guarantee for sure. Uh, not a huge fan. Probably worth a C. Anyway, that does it for this Warband's upgrades, which typically promote reducing enemy accuracy, increasing wounds, immunity to lethal hexes, impairing enemy movement, gaining glory, prompting power card discard, increasing damage, improving defense, improving accuracy, and an unexceptional weapon upgrade. And that does it for all these cards. So as you can see, objective cards are good. I would say there are none that are amazing, though. They do have many solid cards. They do have many cards that are just kind of mediocre or worse. Uh, not exceptional in that department for sure. Gambits are great, though. Very oppressive gambits, which is cool. Very impairing. Upgrades also generally solid, but not bank-breakingly good. So let's take a look at this Warband as a whole and rate them. So first point is a positive point. These guys have very oppressive power cards, which is great and can really screw over the enemy's game plan. It's also thematic because these guys kind of bring the pressure of the ocean with them. So very cool. I like them a lot, specifically the gambits, although they do have some nice upgrades too. I would say they are generally squishy and considering that they're encouraged to be aggressive, it can make for some very risky situations. They don't do a ton of damage. They're called to advance, and they can impair enemies in a lot of ways to help them to survive their advance, which are basically the power cards that sort of remediate their bad defense. But overall, the high aggressiveness combined with the vulnerability is not the best mix. These guys, though, more than almost any warband I could think of, have a capacity for highly tactical positioning, whether it's placing spine fin or do and claw in tactical places to impair enemies. Whether it's the power cards that affect movement, the ability to move objectives, all these things together create a very powerful control game. I would say that this comes with a difficult learning curve. So in the hands of the right player with a lot of experience, these guys can be very annoying for sure. But to a novice player, it would be difficult to be exceptional with this warband. And they do generally have unexceptional objective cards. Their objective cards aren't bad by any means, but they do have some contradicting objective cards, like the swarming versus the spacing out situation i say they don't have any objective cards that are really must have like some warbands have objective cards that for sure you're including in your deck they're just too amazing they're guarantees i would not say that this warband really has that which is a downside obviously since they, they're competing against those other warbands overall though when i look at all these factors i decided to rate this warband as an a they are very good and this is where i place them in the overall scheme of things i'm actually placing them at the end of the a tier right at the back behind zarbag's gits I feel Zarbag's gets are more versatile. Elethanes don't really have the objective holding capacity. They really are prompted to be aggressive, but just with a strong control game. I do put them ahead of Morgue Weights, though, because they're not quite as squishy as Morgue Weights. The control game is very impactful. can really reduce the glory cap of your enemies. So definitely rating these guys as an A, but I do put them, like I said, at the bottom of the A tier. And you guys are, of course, welcome to disagree or agree. So if you have any thoughts or suggestions, please comment below. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and I hope you all have a nice day.